Hello and welcome to Anveshana Reflections in Solitude, a digital festival commissioned and premiered by Sampradaya Dance Creations that will start in the second weekend of May. Well, today will be a conversation with the first artist in this festival, Vijayani Satpati from Bangalore. And here I am from Toronto, Canada, Artistic Director of Sampradaya Dance Creations. So welcome to Bijarni, joining from Bangalore. Namaste. Uh, Namaste Bijarni. So happy to have you here. And we're excited for you to tell us about this new creation that you have, you will be premiering on May the 8th. Right. I believe you're calling it Call of Dawn. Yes. And we are fascinated and want to know all about this new work and tell us, tell us a little more about it. Um, well, it's been, um, first of all, thank you for making it possible. Uh, the commission make, makes it possible to create it. I always had this um, as a dancer, you know, to have uh, several items in one raga in, in a, a performance is a little unnerving always that it, it, it always it uh, there is a fear that it may sound repetitive the, the the sounds of the different songs so i had i wanted to take up this challenge to have uh, a whole show based on one rag i think someone i can hear noise um do i just does someone needs to be muted i am not sure i i I saw that little glitch. Yes, do go yes. ahead. And okay, uh, yeah. So that basically, I decided that this is what I want to do. I had a few pieces in mind uh, for a very, very long time, and I think this just having the time. And I'm also just beginning to choreograph. You might have seen my first piece that I premiered recently. That was my first piece of choreography. And once I had done the first piece, I had a lot of desire to put my minds into different ideas and the opportunity came along and I decided to uh, experiment uh, my, uh, you know, the challenge. I felt like if I had to put few pieces based on the same rag, could I create, um, could I create interesting elements in each and the soundscape still doesn't sound repetitive you know, being based in one rag with with similar notes and and reaches and uh, the graph of the rag, you know, playing in each of these. So that, that's all I wanted to try. And then the themes came along into it. Uh, interestingly, um, this one of the songs that was always in the, it's in the heart of this production is a Nuzrul Giti. It's a Bengali song written by poet, the rebel poet Nozri. And uh, so it was in Ahir Bhairav. And I had asked my brother, who is a music composer, uh, who has worked with me a lot in the past. Uh, I had asked him to compose and give me some Pallavis. I wanted to create solo Pallavis in my own idea. And uh, one of the three pieces he offered was also in Ahir Bhairav. So that's where I took the cue that I have two songs, one a long time desire to dance to this Nozrul Giti. And then I have a Pallavi. When, when someone gives a Pallavi, it's a Mukhra. It's just the first line and an Antara possibility. It has to be built completely with the idea of the dance. So with those two, I started the work. And that's why it became a program based on Ahir Bhairav Rag. And Ahir Bhairav is an early morning rag, and that's why I call it the call of dawn, the sound of the early mornings. Yeah. Fascinating. I know when uh, uh, classical musicians and dancers choose to 
dedicate a whole program to one rag. It is um, challenging because you have to bring so many different uh, variations in the compositions and the rendering yeah. of compositions. And, and certainly uh, for you to have chosen this one direction of one rag. And, uh, and we can't wait to see the different choreographies unfold. And um, so tell me, there are three works. And mm -hmm. um, uh, the first uh, work you've called Wand. And yes. on uh, the concept of Ardhanarishwara. So what is your special treatment of this work? I mean, Ardhanarishwara is such a, such a well uh, explored subject in dance absolutely widely explored <laughs> widely explored i uh, so the as i said the central piece of it because it's based on one rag i wanted to also treat the whole production as one thing and uh, the mazrul song uh, which is basically a young girl's uh, <clears throat> conversation with a deity and i think it's it's like she has a glimpse of uh, a being a very radiant being and uh, she says that who this being is and the song establishes that she worships lord shiva because she's praying to lord shiva saying you are the presiding deity you are the deity i worship and a young girl in indian con context worships shiva to get a good husband. That's what the young girls do. They do Monday fasting, Monday being the day of Lord Shiva. So that gave me the context of what should be the preface to this song, because I placed this song as the centerpiece. So the preface, I wanted to be something dedicated to Lord Shiva. So I looked into a lot of um, shlokas and stotrams. And uh, finally, in this, uh, song also she being a young innocent village girl kind of stands up with her own choice and conviction of who she uh, desires to be her life partner so she has this glimpse of a radiant being uh, and uh, she says that if the radiance is of Lord Shiva, I don't want Shiva as my husband because it will be very intimidating. I would like someone who I can, you know, I can match with. I will. I don't want to be a nothing in front of somebody so awe-inspiring as uh, Lord Shiva. I'd rather have Krishna. So she very clearly says to the God himself that I don't want you. I want this one. So I also feel that that strength to say no to a deity. Like, you know, if you are coming to be my, uh, take the form of my consort, then no, just just wait. I have a desire of my own. You may be God, you may be everything. So that also, for me, felt like a, a voice of, of confidence, a voice of choice that a girl in Indian context where we don't have a voice, a lot of women don't have a voice, I feel feel like that strength comes from something. And I... In Indian context, I feel like being just embodying a woman probably doesn't give us that strength and confidence. But to find uh, when you find the confidence of a certain strength of what can be matched with masculinity, masculinity suddenly you feel like, oh, I do have that strength. Yeah. So because of that, I wanted to choose. I chose the Adhanarishwara Stotram to as a preface. Uh, so if the young girl has done Shiva Puja and then has arrived and has this glimpse as a blessing from after her Puja, then perhaps she has had encounters of the experience of how the man and woman, the masculine and the feminine feel inside one body, inside her body. And also the imagination of how oneness with another, intimacy with a man would be like, because we are not taught any of that. This young girl, maybe 14, 13, 16, you know, we are not taught all that, but the temples teach us that through the imagery. So by embodying the images that the poetry gives us, by embodying the images that the temples display to us, uh, and 
feeling it inside perhaps she has an experience of strength and confidence with which then yeah. she says i know what what i want who i want and that's yeah. through so the that's, that's through the yes. what exactly. a lovely segue. what a lovely segue into that uh, that sort of yeah. journey of choice that she has yes oh, yes yes yeah, yeah. and, and one, but, but the thing is that i feel it's just been created i have performed it once just to make to record of course i have practiced it hundreds of times but i always believe that a piece needs to be performed many many times at least 20 times and it takes about 2 years to perform a piece 20 times in front of the audience for to get the real feel value meaning and uh, also to get to the core of what it actually means so for me what i'm saying now is ideas embodied of course now to choreography but i think it will reveal to me more in as i perform it and i hope at some point i'll be able to perform it wonderful wonderful so tell me um we all have experienced the pandemic and it has for most of us it's unearthed some very difficult experiences mm -hmm. Mm. And now for you, has it been, for for most viewers, I think you're hearing the hum of something in the background. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. We've got some uh, lawnmower going on in the background. I hope that's not disturbing <laughs> you. Sorry. Okay. Has this been confining or liberating for you? Tell me. Uh, the um definitely not confining i wouldn't use that word at all but i think it gave me um the expanded moment of pause that i needed so it was a relief actually when when the lockdown happened and everything had to be stopped a uh, six month uh, tour that was fixed and i had bought tickets and i had planned everything it got cancelled my first thing was a sigh of relief ah oh, and i was also questioning why why did i feel that so obviously there was a very organic and natural need for it so i felt i needed the time and uh, just to kind of pause and i feel right now also having transitioned from a company to be a soloist and uh, from having always been directed to now directing creating my own work i needed that stretch of time to process uh, my own ideas my own thoughts i think i i had to find them i had to find them touch them feel them and then create movement for myself so uh, the time has given me that but it has also meant a lot of loss you know commonly we have we have lost so many people we have lost sunil bhai we have lost astad bhai we have lost so many people and in my close close family friends a very close circle of people that i knew a lot of loss has happened uh, and that also uh, added to how everything stops without you know we can reach the moon but something so small can take over all of us all our advanced technology and everything can just can be nothing meaningless so all the losses and everything that the pandemic has done also has made me reflect very personally i don't want to use spiritually uh, asking uh, myself the question of the attachments i have to uh, needs attachments to be a certain way to perfection and to really find what is meaningful to me how i want to be and i also feel like i'm 48 now i don't want to live till 100 but i feel like i'm somewhere in the middle of my life i felt like i was young and i'm transitioning midlife crisis if you want to call it but i feel like this is what was needed for me and i have enjoyed every moment of it um yeah uh, 
I mean, if there is time at some point, I can talk about how my dance practice has helped me also. I have done a lot of research and I have just put myself in the practice of the research, which I had not done on myself. So it has actually revealed a lot of new ideas to me. Wonderful. And you know, I think this is so important and in particular for many young dancers to listen to because I have been watching you for quite some time on your um, terrace studio in practice for over a year. And the intensity, the freedom, and your single-minded focus on your practice. And now you're talking about your age. Uh, this, is, this is something that is a revelation and should be a revelation for young dancers that this is what, because you're dancing like you're 20 right now, Bijarini. <laughs> Honestly, and this is what young dancers need to know. This is their complete sharanagati and dedication that they need to put in to their practice to be able to reach the, the, the kind of mastery over the body. The, to will the body to do what you want it to do. And so I hope many, many young dancers will, will understand. And I hope we have time for you to talk about what your relationship with your body, with your practice mm -hmm. is on a daily basis. This is so important. So one question that I wanted to have uh, you talk about was, all the compositions were new for your new work? Yes, oh. yes, absolutely, absolutely new. I, I've always wanted to create a solo Pallavi uh, in Odissi traditional music. And uh, like I said, that the three Pallavis I received from my brother, one of them composed by Sukanta Kumar Kundu, uh, is based on Ahil Bhaira, which is uh, in Odia called Chakravaka. Uh, beautiful name because it's the call of the Chakora bird who is separated from the partner in the night and waits for the dawn, calling out for the dawn to come to unite. So I have placed it at the end of the production where, uh, you know, she has kind of with the, the young girl after the Nozrul Giti having established that she might find her uh, consort of her wish, her desire as a persona of Krishna, she anticipates that union. And it's just an abstract exploration of that anticipation in the Chakravaka Rag. Um, very beautifully done in a very traditional, um, it sounds very traditional way of Odyssey music. It's not a traditional available tune, it's a new composition. And all of the pieces are sung very beautifully by a Bangalore-based National Award Filmfare Award winner, Bindu Malini Narayan Swami, who's also composed for me the first uh, Adhana Rishwara Stotram wand. And Ahirini, uh, I call it Ahirini is because it's, um, it, it establishes who this young girl is. She's a cow herdist. So Ahirini word in Bengali is cow herdist and uh, Nozrul Giti, is uh, Nozrul composed and uh, basically set it in tune. So he has set the tune in Ahir Bhairav Rag and uh, I have just adopted it and composed it in my Odyssey style, my idea. Yeah, all are new, all are new works. And you, you mentioned your brother is a flautist Srinivas, right? My One. brother is the flautist and he's the composer and arranger of all the music. And he's also, uh, and my younger brother uh, has also composed the rhythm for the first dance, one. And he's also given his voice to uh, the Pallavi's uh, Mardalam section. It's been played by somebody else, Budhanath Swine, but he's, uh, so three of us work together on this production. What a, what a wonderful family. The arts are run deep in your family. I, it is a difficult subject, but I, I think it's an important subject um, for all artists and the message that uh, I, I did check with you if it was okay if I talked to you about it. You were in Orissa uh, creating the music when your father passed. Mm -hmm. 
that time and was ill and then passed. Yes. Yes. Uh, the depths of loss and grief and sorrow that many artists and that experience. Talk about how dance, music is so liberating and, and finds so much meaning to cope with, with sorrow, loss. Uh, my father's passing was a very hard one. And, and he's the first one I have lost in my family. Um, I didn't realize how close he was to me until I arrived to tend to him for the last one month. Um, it's difficult. I'm still dealing with it. But the only, uh, I have no answers for the whys and hows that I had the questions about his passing and his illness and all of that. But something, not something, dance uh, very quickly anchored me. And I saw it also anchored my brothers. We were all there with him, with my father, while he uh, passed the last, uh, the last month before he passed. And we knew that we were going to do this work, but we couldn't while he was uh, sick. And uh, we took a break for a month. We went away to our own spaces. And I came back to Bangalore and I then went back and we created. This was the first work. So I am actually, I feel very much today when I was looking at some final editing, I felt like this should be a dedication to him. And why it is, because it brought me back to uh, not being cynical. It allowed me to process my grief uh, in a very, very beautiful, in a very aesthetic, very organic, very healthy way. And I see that it also brought our family together. Uh, if I didn't have this project, I would have probably given myself much more time to get back to my daily life uh the grief was uh, grief was immense overwhelming um and now i feel even if i still don't have the answers for why things happen the way they happened uh, i uh i feel healed i feel healed not healed because I have answers. I don't have answers, but something it's it's like taking a cold shower. Even if you know you have come having a road rage fight, you've come back, it's all left undone, but you come and take a cold shower, have a nimbu pani and you feel good. It's like that. It's something else. And I feel dance is that for me. And I have known it for a very long time. I may be very, very disturbed emotionally, but if I just go and practice, it takes care of a lot of of what's going on, all the negative get washed out through the sweat is what I feel. And immediately there is a certain calm that comes in. And that's that's the only thing I rely on. That's that's the only thing that is very uh, whole being, if I can make a uh, you know, word out of that. It, it's something that takes my body, it takes my mind, it takes, it exhausts all aspects of me in a very harmonious way together it's like wringing something dry and then having it fresh anew again so that's how i feel when i when i dance and creating it took much more of that out in a very very positive way thank you for sharing that vijayani such a powerful message for all those who suffer and the power of the arts in our lives. Thank you. You said in an article that I recently read that COVID, the pandemic, was a wake up call. Mm -hmm. That we need to take nature's lead in how we lead our lives. So what is your relationship with dance, with nature? How did those two come together? And I know you live in a very lovely part outside Bangalore, where yes. nature surrounds you. Tell us about that. 
I have a beautiful two and a half acre garden. I grow things. I, I avid gardener, um, sometimes hands on. I have someone who works with my direction there. And it gives me a lot of calm. I'm not a city girl. I know that I'm not a city girl. And um, just looking at trees, the greenery, the flower, the birds, hearing them chirp, the squirrels running around, the grass grow, all of this makes me very uh, much at peace. Uh, and I feel those are necessary. Those are very much part of us. They always have been. And by removing ourselves from these surroundings and taking them into just concrete boxes, does damage to us. I feel that personally, I feel that it, the, something gets stolen away from us. Some spontaneity, some natural element of who we are goes away if we remo remove ourselves from nature. But more than that, what I have seen, how nature uh, embraces change. And I know one thing is learned, one thing is constant, that is change. And how we resist change all the time. Look at this white hair. <laughs> so it's, it's just natural, things change. The leaves disappear. One day the tree looks like it's barren, there is nothing, it's dry, and then tomorrow it sprouts with little new things. And then, so when you see this, uh, nothing feels out of place and the nature doesn't discard it. It embraces it all. And for me, the lesson has been really looking at it. Yes, it's, it's very easy to say I understand it intellectually, but uh, I have not lived at home very much. I've always been outside traveling. So this pandemic also gave me a way to just be in my garden and see the seasons come and touch my garden and change the look of it, change the landscape, everything changed. So the thing I constantly notice from every one day to another is change. And uh, it's, it was basically reminding myself that uh, the sun doesn't set the same way with the same glory every day, the same angle every day. It is different every single day and it is beautiful. It has its own place in the time of the day at that, that day. So I feel like that's my been my lesson to just not resist and accept change. That's what I, I take from, from nature. And also um, just it's soothing power you know just just being in pure nature is so kind and so soothing. what a blessing that you can live life choose to live life yes. like that what yes. a blessing yeah so uh, a last question um just a glimpse into your practice um that you said you talk about and any advice for dancers who are starting their career as a choreographer. Just a quick. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, what I would say, I will answer the second question first. When I go to the floor with an idea, uh, I get very, I very frightened. I don't know. Um, it's not like I don't know where to begin. I have too many things, too many ideas, and I don't know where to start from. And it just feels like there's just loose ends. You know, I don't know. They're, they're, they're like uh, beads scattered all over. I don't have a string. I don't know which string to catch and which bead to weave first into, into the choreography. So that is my challenge. And first few days are very, very frightening, very, very scary. But just trust yourself that soon it may be at tea time. Soon it may be at early morning you're brushing your teeth or you just woke up and you're stretching before you get out of bed and one idea comes and just just tune in to listen to yourself. I feel the ideas come from inside and slowly things fall into place. For me, it's been very, very organic, uh, really, uh, really finding the guidance, uh, not from inside of me. I feel like it just... It, it happens something, something becomes the guide. Uh, but first few days are very, very frightening and don't give up at that point. For me, I have also cried. I've just sat down, held my head and said that, oh my God, this is going to be a complete failure. This is, this is not what happened, you know, what I want to do to myself. 
And at the end of it, when the creation is complete, it's extremely uh, satisfying to see almost a tree full of flowers and fruit stand in front of you. And all it was, was a seed, literally a seed in your head. It was just an idea, but full of potential to become that tree. For everyone, we have our seeds. For everyone, those seeds have the potential for a tree. I think just we have to do the hard work in the beginning to sow it and water it and just be consistent working with it. That's my advice. I'm a new choreographer. I really don't have much advice, but this has been my process. In terms of my daily practice, I, um, I like feeling my body and I listen to my body a lot. I have done a lot of research in expanding the ODC training vocabulary and also finding typical nuances that can stand as independent units of vocabulary in ODC, uh, you know, language of movement. A lot of this work happened when I became a teacher at Mithagram. And uh, that's from 98 onwards, exactly when I started my research. So I have actually had a lot of time to finalize the content of my research, but a lot of it has not been practiced on my body. It's been tested in everyday class. It's very well tested. They work very well. There is nothing wrong with it. But it's the pandemic has given me a chance to really live them in my body. I, I know they work, but you know I have not felt them. And when I'm feeling them, ODC is revealing much more than I have felt before. Just dancing what I have known, the choreographies that I have danced, uh, just those elements doing it again and again has really brought different ideas to me. And that has been extremely precious. And that's why I think you might have seen me doing basic unit practices and make creating combinations. I have basically had a lot of fun doing these things myself, things that I made my students dance uh, the things, but I haven't done them myself much except demonstrating it very convincingly, of course, with my reasons as to why I have constructed things as I have. But now I'm feeling it inside my body. And it's, it's very, very exciting. It's like, oh, I didn't know these things. You know, so, so that's how my practice has been. And of course, um, creating my own dance for my own myself, for my own body as it is now, after 40 years of dancing, um, that's, a, that's a different kind of, I, I feel a certain sense of freedom. Not that I felt tied down before, but I feel a certain sense of uh, completeness and, um, and comfort in, in what I'm creating for my own body. Yeah, that's, that's been a great joy. I'm also creating some work for uh, the students, very senior students that I'm teaching now, and they, they will be a performance soon presented online by them. So re, reworking with Guruji's old choreography on two bodies, creating also restructuring solos in terms of spatial patterns and uh, energy patterns. Uh, looking at Guruji's work, you know, that he created long ago, is seeing how advanced and more intelligent it were, and they were, and how complete they are in terms of their, their structure and their construct. Uh, they have been also very, very um, rich, rich experience in these, these times. And that's what I do. I just go spend a couple of hours working on my body through yoga, color to or uh, Pilates or just I keep making up I just lie down on the floor and whatever my body wants I keep doing it and then I go to practicing my dance so this would be a great uh, opportunity to see some of these explorations of yours and particularly a snippet uh, of uh, the work that you're creating on your beautiful terrace studio could we introduce that now okay <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, I see. I see some some very beautiful textures that emerge from some of the uh, yes. experiments that you're yes. working with the Odyssey form, which are lovely. Um, so I think. Uh, do you have another one to share? Uh, Yeah, I'm so sorry the internet connection has uh, been choppy. Um, I think there are people who want to have sent some questions or comments. Um, perhaps uh, we can start with those. Um, Aishwarya, uh, if you can send those to us. So, question for Bijoyani Didi. One piece of advice that you would give to dancers who are just starting their journeys as choreographers. I think we have covered that. I think we've covered that. Yes. So, let's go but to the next yeah. one. Uh, anyone else? Uh, any other question? Okay, so what is the importance of consistency in, in what, in training or in, in routine, in routine of training? Uh, that's one of the questions. Um, I am a creature of discipline. I feel very calm when I set a discipline for myself and set times could come from my very excessively compulsive uh, persona. I want things very neat and tied and organized in a certain way. So I follow that. I'm not sure it's everybody's way of being. I know people who don't, I know very, very good dancers who have told me that, no, I don't practice my dance every day. I just focus on fitness. And uh, one month before like a major season and performing maybe at the Joyce, I, I just rehearsed that program for one whole month. I don't do anything else. And that's, that's their practice. I'm not that person. So I think what is important is to know what your standard of performance is that your standard of how I want to be on stage. And I think it changes, it, it gets upped, it goes up. Once one knows that, one can define for oneself, identify what is one's comfort level to arrive at that. And that needs to be consistent. That practice needs to be consistent. So if that dancer uh, works for, the, for, for that dancer, it works very well to just focus on fitness, your strength, Building your stamina, stay flexible, agile, all that, so and then one uh, before. Any... Sorry, sorry, I think it's cutting yeah. out. I was just going to ask: Are there any out of the box ways that you experiment with Odyssey? Do you use weights or things like? Oh that? yes. Oh well, that's not Odyssey. It's just strengthening, and I I feel like. Uh, <clears throat> There are a lot of ways we were not trained, and those ways are available now. General fitness, gym work, a uh, lot of Western contemporary techniques that are there. Yoga uses a lot of different techniques now. I, f I feel like I want to embrace it all. Anything to do with, you know, to feel my body is exciting for me. So I put my body to work in, in many different ways. It's generally that I am excited about it, that I try different things. Um, but people can figure out their best way of keeping their body toned, which is very necessary. If you want to be a professional dancer, it's necessary. 
I have a question from Suraj Subramanian, who uh -huh. says, could you describe the Odiyaness of Odyssey? What is the particular flavor that allows it to be distinct from some of the other dance forms? Um, I would say the main thing is the, the curvilinearity, the, the curvedness of everything. So whether it is the turn of the ankle, whether it is the turn of the eye, so these are in limbs, that everything gets a little curved edge in the end of everything or in the beginning of starting a pattern. It's always curved because we are S form. But more than that, it's what is being said also needs an indirectness as if it's curved. It's not direct. It's not go away. Go. It's, it's got a little curvedness even in the expression of it. So when you're emoting, even in a non-narrative work, focusing on that you know, curved way of expressing, that gives rise to a certain, I would say, Oriyanas. Oriyas are not very direct in their expression. They're clear, but not very direct. So I would say that's what... Uh, would be the odianess that that if you're looking for it i'm not if it's convincing but that's what i believe it is what is your advice about the relationship between dance and music we keep talking about understanding the musicality when you dance how would you talk about that to dancers and make them understand that be a better dancer, you've got to understand the, the core of the music, the musicality of it. I, I wouldn't say that one needs to go, I mean, I, I don't know, it may work differently for different people. For me, I feel like it needs to, there is a marriage of music and dance that works very well. And when I say marriage, the marriage is not uh, matched. It's not this goes up, so that goes up. That's not how, how I'm talking about the marriage, but marriage is like, you know, it's like they are locked very perfectly. And sometimes they can counter each other. Sometimes they can um, come one after the other, follow each other. So I feel like it's a feeling that if the music is not felt, if it is thought, I feel like they, there is a mismatch that marriage doesn't work. But if it is felt, then the music itself becomes the guide for the dance to evolve. That's how at least I, I see myself in my limited explorations of choreography. I have worked and I rely on the music to, to guide me. Sometimes I have to give up the, the uh, focus, too much focus on the meaning, too much focus on the rhythm. I, I just let the melody seep into you know, the body and guide the movement out of the body. That's how I feel about it. But I'm sure it is different for different people. Thank you. And I will, I'd like to say that we'll end with that question. And you've been so, so enlightening about, of course, your new work, about your relationship to dance, to music, and your own personal philosophy of, of dance and how you relate to it, to nature, and uh, the process of creation. Well, truly, observers, we're in for a treat. And Bijoini's program is on March the 8th. So please uh, look out for it on our Facebook. All details will be upcoming. And uh, the streaming will be through Shale and more information on our tickets. Bijorini, thank you for making time for this really lovely interview. It's, it's been wonderful. Thank you. thank you. Thank you for the commission that made me, that helped me create the work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you viewers for watching this through. And please look out for details. Next week, I will be in conversation with uh, Methil Devika about she's a Mohani Atom artist, a fantastic artist. And she will be talking about her new work. So please watch out next Saturday, same time. And uh, 
Thank you again. Thank you, Bijarni. Thank, Thank you. you.